I'm David Johnston and in this talk I'm going to explore David Gwilym's connections with the Cistercian Abbey of Strata, Florida and what they might have meant for him. I'll begin by saying a little about David himself. He's generally regarded as the greatest of all Welsh language poets and he's also recognised as a major figure in European literature of the Middle Ages. You can read about his life and work in my article about him in the Dictionary of Welsh Biography, which is freely available online. The beginning of the article is on this slide. David was a member of, the, of a gentry family in the parish of Llambadan Fawr near Aberystwyth in the north of the Ceredigion region. He was active around the middle of the 14th century, mainly in the 1340s, and probably died relatively young, about 1350. A large body of his poetry has survived in later manuscripts, almost 150 poems, consisting of some poems in praise of noble patrons, a few religious poems, and the majority on the subject of love and the natural world. All his poems are available online on a site called davidacquillin.net. Here's the home page on this slide. The site is fully bilingual. You can view the Welsh texts and English translations side by side. And you can also listen to recorded recitals of the poems. David was a pioneer of the new Cowydd metre, a light and popular song metre in rhyming couplets of seven syllable lines. His was a new voice in Welsh poetry, very different to the impersonal praise tradition. He put his own experiences and emotions at the heart of his poems. He revels in the delights of God's creation, including sexual love. And in so doing, he challenged Christian moral doctrine which in its most extreme form held that all material pleasures were sinful. An example of his irreverent attitude towards the religious establishment is his poem Merched Llambadarn, The Girls of Llambadarn, in which he depicts himself during a service in his parish church, craning his neck to eye up the girls behind him and turning his back on the altar. So it might be thought surprising that he should be associated with the Cistercian monastery, given that the monks of the Cistercian order renounced all worldly things. However, abbots in the later Middle Ages live very much like secular noblemen, welcoming poets into their households and receiving praise for their lavish hospitality. Strata Florida has always had a strong Welsh identity with a long tradition of support for Welsh language culture, going back to its foundation in the late 12th century by the Lord Trisap Griffith, patron of the first known Eisteddfod at Cardigan in 1176. We don't know for sure who the abbots were during David's lifetime, but a Welshman named Meredith Bull is known to have been abbot in 1336. And from 1344 onwards, when David was in his prime as a poet, the abbot was Llewellyn Vachan, who is known to have been a patron of Welsh poets. It's perfectly possible that David Ack Williams' poems would have been performed in the abbot's house at Strata, Florida. His religious poems would, of course, have been very acceptable, such as his short Cowydd in praise of the Trinity, or one describing a painting of Christ and his apostles on a wooden panel, which you can see on this slide. This is not what David at Gwilym is most renowned for, but he certainly did produce some fine religious poetry, and we will look at another example later on. The poems which boast of liaisons with married women might have been a step too far for performance in the abbot's house. 
but we shouldn't assume that a Cistercian abbot would necessarily have condemned all celebration of the joys of God's creation. A poem which shows how David perceived God in the natural world is Offeren y Llwyn, the Woodland Mass, in which the woodland is depicted as a church and the birds as clergy celebrating Mass and worshipping God. But the poem may not be quite so innocent because the thrush, which represents the priest, has been sent to David by his lover Morvith. And the message seems to be that sexual love has God's blessing and is no sin. David appears as a shameless womanizer in one of his most notorious poems, Traferth Meun Tavan, Trouble at an Inn, in which the first person narrator arrives in a town, takes lodgings at an inn, sees a pretty girl, wines and dines her, and makes an assignation to come to her bed after all the other occupants of the inn have gone to sleep. Things go disastrously wrong when he trips over furniture in the dark, waking three English merchants who think he is a thief, and ends up cowering in a corner and praying to God for forgiveness. Now, Cistercian monks could have enjoyed this comic tale as much as anyone else. But the poem could also be understood as a moral exemplum, showing the consequences of the sins of pride, gluttony and lust, which would have eased any pangs of conscience the monks might have felt about that enjoyment. And they could have felt reassured that the monastic life kept them well away from the dens of iniquity which were the towns of medieval Wales. One of the key features of Davlet Gwilym's poems is the way they were open to multiple interpretations. And I think that would have been true for a monastic audience as much as for secular ones. So, what are the grounds for associating Davlet Gwilym with Strata Florida? The primary piece of evidence is a poem by David's contemporary, Griffith Grieg of Anglesey addressing a yew tree over David Aquilim's grave at Strata, Florida. Here are the opening lines of that poem. Rowen i was, ger mir a strad flir ai flas. Da dyw urthid, gwynfid gwydd, de dyfi yn di Dafydd. The yew tree for the best young man by the wall of Strata, Florida and its mansion. God's blessing on you, paradise of trees, that you have grown to be David's house. This plays on the theme of the Daildi, the house of leaves, where lovers find shelter in the woodland, which is a key topos in so many of David Aquilim's poems. In death, the yew tree provides him with the house which he desired in life, and being evergreen, it is a constant shelter. The tree in question has been identified with the largest of the two yew trees in the cemetery of St Mary's Church, adjacent to the abbey site. One which, judging by its size, is likely to have been there in the 14th century when Griffith Grieg composed his poem. However, we cannot be sure that the tree addressed by Griffith Grieg is one of the ones still standing. Since Henry VIII's antiquary, John Leyland, recorded in 1540 that there were 39 great yew trees in the cemetery. We know that by 1874 there were only three remaining and now there are only two. That must have been a pretty remarkable collection of yew trees in the 14th century, which may be one reason why Griffith Grieg chose to commemorate David by addressing one of the yews. In fact, the Ancient Yew Group website, ancientyew.org, states that this would seem to be the loss of what might have been the finest churchyard yew site 
in the world. So it is quite likely that the tree of Griffith Grieg's poem has now gone. Nevertheless, the poem, if taken at face value, is compelling evidence that Davidak Gwilym was buried at Strata, Florida. A memorial plaque to that effect was placed on the north wall of the Abbey by the Honourable Society of Cymru Dorion in 1951. Several references in Welsh poetry of the 15th and 16th centuries to David's grave under the yew tree at Strata, Florida, show that there was a tradition that he was buried there. But those references were most probably based on knowledge of Griffith Grieg's poem, and so cannot be taken as independent evidence for his burial there. There is, however, one good reason why Griffith Grieg's poem should not be taken at its face value. And that is the possibility that Davidak Gwilym may have still been alive when it was composed. Welsh poets of the 14th century had what may seem to us a rather peculiar, not to say morbid, habit of composing elegies to people who are still alive, and particularly to their fellow poets. These are known in Welsh as marnadai fig, that is, mock elegies. We can be certain of this practice because there are several instances of pairs of elegies by two poets to one another, one at least of which must have been composed while the subject was still alive, and most probably both were. This is true of David Aquilim and Griffith Grieg, who composed an elegy to David in addition to this poem addressing the yew tree. Why they did this is not easy to say. It might be taken as a sign of the late medieval obsession with mortality in the period of the Black Death. But it could also have been a witty and sophisticated way of paying a compliment whilst the subject was still around to appreciate it. It's not possible to be absolutely certain that Griffith Greek's poem to the yew tree was composed before David at Gwilym's death. But we can see that he is paying tribute to David's nature poetry in these lines. David gwedida dyfi ath naith o'i fabolaeth fi dy urdo yn di urdhael ti a phob llwyn yn dwy'n dail. David after you grew from his youth onwards exalted you as a house of le green leaves, a dwelling with leaves on every bush. This is the Dale Dee, the lover's house of leaves, which I mentioned earlier. And it's exactly the kind of literary compliment which was typical of mock elegies. Although there is no poem by David specifically about a yew tree, he may have composed one that has not survived. And his poem to another evergreen, a Llwyn Kellyn, the holly grove, is a good example of the way he depicts the natural world in harmony with human passions, celebrating the holly grove as a shelter for lovers even during winter. If David was still alive when Griffith Grieg's poem was composed, what difference does that make to the value of the poem as evidence for his association with Strata, Florida? I would argue that the possibility does not necessarily undermine the value of the poem, because Griffith must have thought it likely and reasonable that David would have been buried there. It was common enough in the Middle Ages for people to choose where they were to be buried. So it could be that Griffith's poem reflects David's own wishes. And it's interesting that in the passage we've just looked at, Griffith speaks of David's devotion to the yew tree, Oi Vabolaith, from his youth. 
Does that refer to his nature poetry in general or to his long-standing association with Strata Florida and fondness perhaps for that particular yew tree? I should point out that there is one piece of contrary evidence regarding Davidette Williams' place of burial. And that is a list of poets' burial places written in the middle of the 17th century by the antiquarian Robert Vaughan, which states that Davidette Gwilym was buried at Talafachai, that is, the pre monstratensian Abbey at Tally near Llandela in Carmarthenshire. There is nothing at all to connect David with Tally, but then again, that in itself might be an argument in favour of the authenticity of the claim, precisely because it is so unexpected. So make of that what you will. Personally, I think that that late list weighs pretty lightly in the scales compared to Griffith Grieg's contemporary poem. So let's go back to the memorial plaque. What then can we say about any links David Aquilin may have had with Strata Florida, which would explain why Griffith Grieg would have assumed that he would be buried there? One possibility is that David received some of his education there in his boyhood. David's poems strongly suggest that he was literate in both Welsh and Latin, and he must have learnt to read and write at some centre of learning. There was a flourishing scriptorium producing manuscripts at Strata Florida within his native region of Ceredigion, and it would have been quite natural for David to have been sent there as a boy to acquire literacy skills, where he would also probably have sung in the choir of the Abbey Church. Although there is no direct evidence to support this supposition, there is a tantalising poem by David entitled Gwaud Morvith, Morvith's Mockery, in which he addresses his lover Morvith, who had rejected him, he tells us, because she did not want a man with a tonsure. David responds indignantly that he had never worn a monk's habit or learnt a word of Latin on parchment, and that it was his unrequited love for her which had made his hair fall out. There's clearly some very sophisticated humour at play here, and the joke would surely be all the funnier if he had, he had actually been educated at a monastic school in his youth. This would be by no means the only occasion in his poems that David denies something which his audience would have known to be patently true. And if the poem was performed at Strata, Florida, the monks would surely have found it highly amusing. One of the finest products of the scriptorium at Strata, Florida, is the collection of poetry by the court poets of the Welsh princes of the 12th and 13th centuries, now known as the Hendrigadrev Manuscript, and in the care of the National Library of Wales, which can be viewed online on the NLW website. The manuscript was put together very soon after the final demise of the independent princes at the end of the 13th century and was initially the work of a single scribe known today as Alpha, most probably a monk at Strata, Florida, with subsequent additions by colleagues within the scriptorium. Alpha's hand can be seen on the upper part of this page on the slide. The Hendrik Adreth manuscript may have still been at Strata, Florida when David first came to the Abbey and could have given him his first sight of these classic texts of the Bardic tradition. However, around this time, it seems to have passed into the possession of Yean Llwyd and his wife Anne Harad of Glyneiron near Llangeitho, just a few miles from Strata, Florida where visiting poets wrote their poems to the family on blank spaces in the manuscript. This cultured family were important patrons of Welsh literature, and it was for their son Hyderch 
that the famous compendium known as the White Book of Hrederch was produced, most probably commissioned from the Strata Florida Scriptorium, including the earliest full text of the four branches of the Mabinogi. We see here how the influence of Strata Florida extended to the culture of the surrounding area. David Apgwilin was one of the poets who received patronage at Glyneron, and he composed an elegy to Angharad, possibly while she was still alive, and also one to her son Traderch, which is certainly a mock elegy, since Traderch would have been a young man at the time and is known to have lived into old age. And like other visiting poets, David may well have written a copy of one of his own poems in the Hendrigadreth manuscript. On this page, we see the end of a poem in the main hand, Alpha, and then added in a blank space below it, a poem entitled, and you see it's highlighted here, Englunion Agant David Fluid Vab Gwilim Gam Ir Grog O Gair. Englunion sung by David Fluid, son of Gwilim Gam, to the rood of Cair. This is the only example of the full form of David Aquilim's name, including his own epithet Thuid, perhaps referring to brown hair, and that of his father Cam Crooked, denoting some physical deformity. The handwriting is the kind one would expect from someone who had learnt to write at Strata Florida in this period, but it is too irregular and laboured to be the hand of a professional scribe. According to our foremost authority on medieval Welsh manuscripts, Dr. Daniel Hughes, there is a strong likelihood that this is the hand of David Aquilin himself, probably when he was a young man. The Hendrigadred manuscript also contains a copy of David's elegy to Angharad in another 14th century hand, and there is another of his poems in the White Book of Hrederch in a third contemporary hand. Of the three, this is the one most likely to be the poet's own handwriting. The poem is a long series of four line Englunion stanzas, perhaps originally as many as 50, in praise of the rood or cross, probably in St Mary's Chapel in Carmarthen, here called Cair, as in the name Sheer Gar, which is still used today for Carmarthenshire. The chapel itself has long disappeared, but its name survives in St Mary's Street between Knott Square and Guildhall Square. The rood had on it what was believed to be a living image of Christ in majesty. and The purpose of the poem may have been to attract pilgrims to the chapel. It certainly shows that David's Christian faith was genuine and deeply felt. And this is another poem which would have been well received at Strata Florida. It's also interesting to note the implicit contrast that is made in the poem between the cross as a symbol of peace and the castle just a few hundred yards from the church, which represented oppressive military power, as we see in the very first stanza. Creve aberf you nerf, nid an ayr traeswyr, eithr mewn trawswyrth didair, Crier Maurglod, Croyurim Erglier, Krog Bedwarban o Gan Geir. Strong sacrifice is the strength, not in oppressor's battle, but in gentle yet powerful miracle. Highly praised, renowned holy relic, pure its vigour of the four pointed rood from White Carmarthen. We can sense here Welsh resentment towards the castles which enforced English rule in Wales. And I think the contrast between different kinds of power, military and spiritual, offers a clue as to the significance of Strata Florida for David Ap Gwilym as a spiritual centre of resistance to political oppression and a bastion of Welsh national identity as evidenced by its preservation of the poetry and chronicles of the independent princes. 
the national importance of Strata Florida became very apparent a generation after Davy's time when it was occupied by English troops during the Glyndwr Rebellion. And so it is not difficult to understand why David Aquilim would have wished to be buried at Strata Florida. And to me, that is more important than the answer to the factual question as to whether or not he actually was buried there, a question which cannot be definitively answered. But he certainly should have been buried at Strata Florida. Thank you for listening. <laughs>